My last mission, which was on November 30th of 1944, uh, that's when we had our mid-air collision. What was the target, do you remember? The target was Merseburg, Germany, oil refineries. Uh, it was a maximum, what they call a maximum effort uh, bomb run. They had, we were, uh, the RAF was involved with it, and uh, we had something like two, over 2,000 bombers flying. In the morning, they told us uh, that we were gonna, well, they've dropped the curtain, and then we saw where we were going, deep, what they call a deep penetration mission. And they told us that the flak would be very heavy because they were, the Nazis were pulling in the guns from the Ruhr Valley as the uh, Allies were advancing. So they, they said there would be at least a thousand anti-aircraft guns firing at us. And uh, we weren't too happy about that, but uh, we did take off and we did arrive over the target. The sky was black with flak and it did do a lot of damage. Uh, we were flying right wing to Colonel Dolan who was leading the whole effort. He was a radar ship. Uh, he had a crew of 10 and we had nine on our ship. Something happened to Dolan that I guess they were concentrating on him because he was a lead plane and he lost control of his plane and he hit us. Um, our co-pilot I think was dead at the time because he, uh, we, we couldn't get any response from him. How, uh, how so? Was he dead as a result of the collision? No, he, no, that was pr prior to the collision. The uh, pilot called the engineer to go up and check. He said, come up and check on Maury. He's not responding or anything. And, uh, the engineer went up there and he didn't get any response out of him. Uh, and I assumed that the, he probably was fatally injured. And then that's when it all happened. I was in the ball and I heard our Custis Green, you already interviewed him. He said, Pete, Pete, and then Pete, uh, that's our, our, co our pilot. He said, I see it, I see it. And all of a sudden there was this crunching noise and I said, uh oh, something happened. And I was able to swing my guns down in my turret and my uh, waist gunner uh, opened up the hatch for me. We had made a sort of an agreement. I said, Eddie, it was Eddie D'Anzillo. If anything ever happens, make, if my guns are pointed, just make sure my guns are pointed down and I'll take care of getting up in the waist. And that, that's, the, that's what happened. If it wasn't for him, I don't think I would be here today. So he opened up the hatch for exactly you to get out. Exactly right, yep. And I must tell you this. Can I go back to the evening before? All right, the evening before, I, we retired for the night, and I was very uneasy for some reason. I had a, a sense that something was gonna happen, and I was trying to figure out how I could bring my chute into my turret with me, you know, to bring a chute into the ball turret. It was quite a job. Anyway, I did, I, I cut the riser strap on the right side of my chute, uh, on my harness, and I had the, Eddie, handed to me when I went, I, I clipped it, and when I went down into the turret, Eddie handed it to me, and I, I cradled it in my arm while we were on our mission. And uh, that's what saved me, because that's the first time I wore my chute. Uh, had, you, had you clipped that chute on when you were in the turret? The chute was clipped to the riser strap that I had cut. So it was clipped on half, you know. Oh, the, other, the other side was not normal. Well, when Eddie opens up the hatch, what happened after that? Well, I rose up. You know, the plane was on the, starting to go down from the collision, and naturally, to force, I just rose up into the waist. I didn't even climb up, I rose up into the waist. And then, luckily, and my chute was trailing me, and fortunately, it didn't hook onto anything. Otherwise, I would have had a blossoming chute in the, in the waist of the plane. So I, I pulled the chute towards me, and, and the plane at that time was still intact. And then all of a sudden it broke in half right at the radio operator's room. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the plane. At the radio operator's room, that broke off right at that hatch. So I had a big wide open space there that I was t attempting to get to in order to get out of the plane. It was going this down this way and I was fighting that. And all of a sudden the, the plane lurched so that the open end was up and I sort of had, rose out of it. And I was aware of somebody pushing me, and I'm, I'm sure it was Eddie D'Anzillo, my waist gunner. He figured that I had a chance to get out. He didn't have a chance. Did he have his chute on? No, we never wore our chutes. Well, after that, I was in, in open in the, in the air, and I was tumbling. And as I was falling, I would try to 
pull my chute down to clip it on, and then I would start tumbling. They instructed us, if you ever jump out and you have to straighten out, they give us straighten out your arms and your body and you will go into a normal position. And I, after I did that, I would try to pull the chute down, then I would start tumbling again. And eventually, I, you know, I, was, I kept falling and falling and falling, and the, the, the trees and the building started getting bigger. So I said to myself, Bill, you better pull the cord and see what happens. Just pray that it holds. And it did. But I, I was dangling on one rider's strap, gliding over this village, town of Halley. This was an outskirt suburb of Merseburg. And uh, naturally, the townspeople were gathering, and they followed me across. And I landed in the farmer's garden, and the wind pulled me, and I sort of did a little damage to his garden. And the, the civilians got a hold of me, and they had to put a rope around my neck. And um, of course, I I was sympathetic with them because uh, what would I do if 2,500 bombers flew over my home and? killed friends and destroyed my home. Uh, anyway, uh, they, there was one guy in there in a little leather jacket and a, and a brimmed hat, and he had a rifle, and he, he was instigating them, really. And uh, I thought for sure I was going to be hanged, but except that the intervention of an, a Luftwaffe officer saw me coming down, and he came on a bicycle, and he approached a group of people, and he took out a small arms. And I guess in German, he told them to get away from me and leave, leave me, and they did that, but they were grumbling. And uh, a few minutes later, he came to me in perfect English. He said, you know, they would have hung you. I said, boy, I, said, I, 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 I told them that I didn't, well, couldn't blame them if they did. And I said, I'm glad you speak English. He said, I should, I'm, I'm from Chicago. He was on vacation there with his wife, and he was conscripted into the German service. I wish I had gotten his name. I never did. And anyway, he told me to take up my chute, and he would take care of me. So he brought me to a, a, a small building where he had an office. And uh, I had my chute with me, and he, he got on the phone, and he probably called the local jail. And then uh, they did come to get me, the police. And. Uh, I asked him, uh, what can I do with the shoot? He said, well, you'll take the shoot with you. And then he had a secretary there. And I said, would you like, I, I, I told him to ask her if she would like to shoot. And he said, uh, yeah, she would like it because she's planning on getting married. <laughs> so that was something. I went to Merzburg three times. We were scheduled to go four times and they stood down and we all cheered. But on November 30th, we went to Merzburg and it's a mission that I never will forget because I lost five comrades that day. Tell us what you remember about that mission. That mission we flew and uh, we had some problems of overrunning the IP, whether it was caused by a tailwind or whatever it was. And the IP is a point where the initial, where you turn in, and this is planned by the group. They try to get you in with the least amount of guns, and they try to get you out as quick as possible. What happened is we overshot that. We ended up going over a town of Zeitz, Germany, and we always kidded about it because they had a bunch of master sergeants there and their aircraft. They were, they were sharp, and we got the living daylights shot out of us over that target. And here we weren't even to Merzburg yet. When we finally turned and got on the target, we were bucking a headwind. Bombing missions were about 160 miles an hour and we were bucking a headwind. So I was told afterwards that we were in flak for 21 minutes. During that time, I can remember incidents, things happening uh, that I'll never forget. And uh, some of those people were killed that day. 
But after we got off the target, I said, thank God. And all of a sudden, there was only three of us left. Lieutenant Gary, or I, he must have been a captain. Gary was in the lead ship with Colonel Dolan. So there were three planes Three left. planes left up there. And the number two plane was a crew, a Peterson's crew 407. I remember that because I flew on mission with them. Their tail gunner was hurt, and so I took his position. And so all of a sudden, the tracking flak got us. It was right on us. And here we are. We thought we were out of the flak. And all, I looked. I turned my head to the right, and I could see the number two ship. The reason I remember it had 407. I flew with them. And while I'm looking at them, the lead ship must have took a hit in the wing because he rolled right over on top of them. And these two pair, two airplanes just chewed each other up. Three men in Peterson's crew survived. They're, two of them are here. Two of them are here. And unbelievable. Uh, Colonel Dolan was killed. Uh, maybe you have some stories on this. You know, he was killed. Uh, there in uh, in Mers over in Mersburg, from what I understand, from the people. We uh, at that time when they came together, uh, we were in dire straits. The uh, one number two engine was windmailing. It started to windmail over Zeitz. The pilot and co-pilot were so busy they didn't have time to feather it. And of course, when this happened, they had no oil to feather it. So we were down to two engines, and the pilot put it in the dive, pulled it up. He had heard that if you did this, the prop might the prop might come off. Under these circumstances, it didn't come off. It didn't come off. Because if it's windmilling, it's a dr it's a it's drag. It's a drag. It's yeah. a drag. It's a drag right there. See, and so we were down to two engines. Uh, we were ordered to throw everything out. Then we were down to one engine, just one engine. Uh, finally got the orders to bail out. Uh, when I went out, I was on the ground in less than two minutes. It was 10 tenths cloud cover. You couldn't see the ground. Uh, what I, was it like to jump out of one of those planes? Uh, it, was, it was either do that or go down with the ship. and. Uh, I know I should have been the first man out, but I must have paused because somebody went out ahead of me and I could see their body, body tumbling in the clouds. And then I went out. Uh, it's, this is one where I have some problems because the man that landed next to me was a friend of mine. He was the first radio operator. And uh, he was on the bottom of a hill in between us was a German who was liming the field in the wintertime. There was snow on the field, but he was liming the field. And I thought, what do I do? I'm 120 miles in Germany. There's snow on the ground. Maybe there's strength in numbers. Maybe there's strength in numbers. And then I heard a noise behind me. When I had landed, I was very fortunate because I landed in a small tree and I ended up that far from the ground so I could just slip out of my chute. But the engineer came down the hill from behind me. And so we took off and we were loose that night back in the woods trying to keep warm, deciding what to do. And that night, the Germans in this little village, I didn't know it at the time, the Germans were singing all their songs what I didn't know is the, the, man, the man that landed next to me was taken to that town and he was killed by a German civilian with a pitchfork. Mm -hmm. And so all my life I've said, why me? Why me? Is there an aspect of, and not just that event, but all those missions you flew, some planes survived, others didn't. Where did fate, I mean, your sense of fate fall in all this, you know what I mean? I, I, I look at it this way, you didn't make a lot of friends because you didn't know whether they would be there in the next day. 
you didn't know, you didn't make a lot of friends. I know that. Um, and you went up over the idea, it's not going to be me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. You had to have that attitude. Or some, I think there were, sure, there were some people that had, got out of flying because of that, had to, because they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. The last we heard, you're at night and you're in the forest. Where did it go from there? Well, we were, like I say, around Castle, Germany, and uh, we didn't know this had happened. The ball turret gunner was killed right there. His chute never opened. And then we didn't find out till later that the three officers didn't get out of the ship, so they went down. That's how low we were. They went down with the airplane and were, were killed in action. What, what was the name of your plane, by the way? Uh, Ain't Misbehaving was the name of our plane. Uh, the number was 7041. I can remember the number. Uh, we, were, we walked that night. First we got in, way back in the woods trying to keep warm. And then I, we talked it over and just decided that we should try to walk at night. So we were walking at night, heading west, and uh, uh, your mind plays tricks on you. We were a little bit thirsty, we hadn't had anything to eat, and with our escape kits, we had some water purifiers. So we got on top of this hill in the snow, and down below was a little creek with some water. At that time, we went down there, which we shouldn't have done. We went down there, got our escape bags full of water with our pills, and about that time, a German came around the corner and he saw us. So he picked up a club and uh, took us, escorted us to the road. Unbeknownst to me, he was taking us back to the same village where we had, I had lost two comrades. About that time, a German dump truck uh, I called it, it was a dump truck like ours, came by and they took us away from the civilian and it was full of airplane parts and they would point at me and I'm sure it was parts of airplanes that they were told to get certain parts. I do remember one German shared a half of sandwich with me with some food and it was German brown bread and it wasn't too good but I learned it I learned to like it <laughs> for the months later Take us through the, the, the third mission. Uh, do you remember the date of the mission? 14th of January, 45. Where did the mission go? Went to Durban, Germany. It was an underground oil storage near Berlin. So it was be a very long mission. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two crews trained together in the States and we were both crews signed to the 390th. We were both crews were scheduled to fly that day, but they decided they didn't want two new crews going as far as Berlin on a mission. They, so they dumped the other crew for a different experienced crew. And so they stayed home and, and we flew. And uh, so that changed a little bit, but just when we were ready to go, they weren't coming. So well, that's all right, you know, it's a long mission and he decided they didn't want two new crews there. Um, of course, being new flew, we flew tail and Charlie. And uh, we, the briefing, I don't remember anything special about it. We And being had, tail and Charlie was a more vulnerable position? It's where the new planes flew and it's, you're back, if anybody comes in from behind, you're, you're the first thing they see. So, it it I don't think any place was safe, but <laughs> but it, it was because of turbulence and so forth. It was rather hard to fly that, and uh, but it was just the last plane in the formation. Was the flight over there uneventful? The, the 
a beautiful day, clear as a bell, see the ground, and there was no navigation, there was no problem. I mean, it's so simple. You can see where you're going. We had good maps and so we knew where we were and all that. And, uh, we got to the IP and, and turned and were headed toward the target, and uh, that's when the fighters really hit us. I was in the A squadron, and it was the only plane they got out of the A squadron, but they hit us first and then hit the uh, C squadron. And uh, but it was a strange experience. Was what was yeah? What was the first you were going in? You had you dropped your bombs yet? No, still had our bombs, <clears throat> and. Uh, the first thing I saw was explo things exploding right in front of the plane. It seemed very close, but they just kept getting closer. And it was 12, 20 millimeter fighter shells. And uh, I wasn't sure what had us at, at that point. And then it sure wasn't very long and they hit the plane and just seemed to rake from a one ring right across us. And uh, it was a very short time after that uh, we started spinning and the pilot said he couldn't hold it to bail out. Do you know what kind of fighter it was? FW-190. Both FW-190s and ME-109s hit us that day, but I think it was an FW-190 that did the dance on us. Mm. Um, so the, the pilot notified that the, the plane was starting, to, he was having we, trouble we controlling We started sort of a flat spin and he said he, he couldn't hold it to bail out. And uh, when he said that, I reached for what I thought was a carrying handle, but it came up with a ripcord handle. I had, of course, all the clothing you can wear huh? and the, the flak vest over everything. Well, you pull a strap and a flak vest falls off. And the, uh, I had my parachute harness on but no parachute. It was on the deck beside me. And when I grabbed for the carrying handle, I pulled the ripcord. And the ripcord's a big handle and a carrying handle, just a little cloth handle on one end. And uh, but it came right on out and the parachute just opened up. You probably know they're about roughly the size of a big loaf of bread with elastic bands. And when a ripcord comes out, the bands pull the canvas cover apart and a little pilot chute pops up, like a small umbrella, catch your wind and pull it out. Well, I, it, it was all right there on a deck and we're starting to spin. So I managed to grab the thing and I hooked on to one side and I was hooking the other on and the bombardier had a chute on and was closer than you are from me right now and uh, ready to go. And really that's about I got one side hook and I was trying to hook the other on and that's about when I passed out or it blew up. The next thing I was on the ground in, in German and snow and uh, time wise I have no idea how much later or anything but there were Germans home guard coming with pitchforks and shotgun. I could see them coming toward me and the only thing I knew we were German they had armbands on it, the swastika on it. And the, uh, I think my feeling is that all, my, all the other crew were killed, buried in a mass grave. And I think that pulling that chute open in a plane, and if it exploded, I fell with part of the nose till the pilot chute caught enough wind to pull me out of the plane. On the ground, I didn't have any gloves on, no shoes, and I was in snow, but nothing was frozen, no frostbite. The temperatures, you know, at, at the 28,000 or 27 we were flying at, it has to be at least 40 below, and you go out with a chute open, I, something would have frozen. So that's where I figure I might have to fi fall several thousand, maybe down to 5,000 or so before I got out. Not sure of a thing. Mm -hmm. Were, you must have, when you are on the ground, were you conscious when you hit the ground? No. Mm. When you woke up, how disoriented were you? Uh, well, I wasn't sure where I was. And, and you know, I'm laying in the middle of the snow and a 
in a farm field, and uh, it took maybe not too long, after, especially after I saw the Germans, to realize, oh, I know where I am now, yeah. And uh, we were pretty close to not too far from Berlin. Yeah, we were uh, going into a uh, target in the suburbs of Dusseldorf, Germany, and everything was going fine. It, uh, we weren't, uh, we could see flak way off the side, but they hadn't been shooting at our group. And uh, I don't believe there was any uh, fighter uh, reported, uh, enemy fighters. And everything was so nice going along, and uh, so what in the, uh, we come to the IP and turn on that. That's when the bombardier takes control of the airplane. And uh, I was up there just sort of slowly spinning around watching for fighters. And just as the bombardier called bombs away, I was looking at the plane beside us. And I saw the bombs trailing out of the bomb bay. And then that plane just blew up. And the same instant, we took uh, two direct hits through the left wing one through the right wing, and we lost three engines just in a few seconds there. The fourth engine, which was number three on the airplane, was damaged, but the pilot was able to use that. Uh, I think he mentioned he had probably 60, 65 percent power left on it. He put the nose of the airplane down and got as much power out of that one engine as he could to pull us down on a gliding path. Uh, we did about a about a 180-degree turn away from the target. And uh, the pilot called me down, and uh, he told me to go to the back of the airplane and see uh, if there's any damage down there or any injuries. And I went back and found a radio operator was wounded in the foot. And uh, then I went on back and got all the, the uh, three gunners back there to uh, get out and throw, pull all the guns out and throw them overboard, throw all of those heavy ammunition cans overboard to lighten the plane. It was, uh, it was almost suicide to bail out over a, a target area. They didn't like us down there. So uh, we wanted to get as far away as we could. We was hoping we'd make it over the front lines into France, but uh, uh, we weren't flying the right direction. He was more south-southwest instead of going west. He had no instruments. Everything was shot out. Inst Intercom was shot out, so I couldn't talk to him. And after uh, I gave them the instructions to throw everything out, then I went back and proceeded to give first aid treatment to the uh, radar operator. He had a piece of flak down in his foot. And it wasn't bleeding much, uh, just a little bit of blood. So I called the pilot and told him, and I told him it wasn't a life-threatening wound. And uh, then the ball turret counter came in, so I told him to uh, continue with the first aid and I went back to the cockpit, reported to the pilot and because at the time we were going to hope to uh, crash land in some nice field. But when I got back there I started talking to the pilot and he kept push, pointing out to the right window. He said, we can't crash land, that engine caught fire. So uh, when you have a fire on board you don't want to crash land because it's going to blow for sure it might blow any of it so I had to go back then tell everybody to line up we had to bail out now no at first uh, the pilot told me he was going to try to crash land so I didn't pick up my parachute uh, I the engineers uh, wore or used the uh, chest chute because we could wear the harness when we was in the turret but couldn't there wasn't room for the the parachute, so we kept it on the floor. So I went back and told them to li everybody to line up. We knew what position we were supposed to be in, except we, you always put the dead or the wounded in front if it's, you have the time, which we did. And uh, so co pilot was going to come back and tell us when to bail out. And so when I got to fuselage, I looked forward and the co pilot was coming through in Bombay and he waved to us to go. So we put the 
the uh, radio operator out, and uh, then I realized I don't have a parachute. So I don't think anybody ever went through a B-17 as fast as I did. Back to the cockpit, picked up my chute, hooked it on, turned and come back out. And just as I got back the fuselage, I saw the feet of the last list man going out. So it was my turn. So I stepped around the co-pilot, and his face was just as white as could be. And I hesitated a moment and asked him if he's all right. He said, get out. So I just turned and dove out. So I made my parachute jump, and I, you know, you're supposed to count ten, and I think I probably said one, five, ten, and <laughs> pulled that. Well, I laid back. They, I, I attended a uh, class on bailing out the day before, and it was fresh in my mind. So I laid back with the parachute, uh, the chest chute. You wanted to lay back and go down in a uh, horizontal position. Uh, legs together and arms bound each side and pull your head back and turn this because that chute coming up could hit your head and maybe break your neck. And I did, every, I think I did everything right and uh, then I brought my right hand up and pulled the uh, D-ring and the chute opened up just the way it's supposed to. And as I floated down, uh, somebody was shooting at me with a rifle because I hear the bullets buzzing by me. I'll tell you, I did if I wasn't a Christian before I became one then, I was praying. And, and that shooting stopped. And then uh, it looked like uh, it was real quiet. Well, about 15 seconds after I bailed out, the plane blew up. So that's how close I come in. The co-pilot was behind me. And uh, it was floating down. and. Uh, I, uh, I saw this big forest down there and then a farm and some buildings and then a town over there and I think that town's probably where that shooting was coming from. And I, I, I was swinging in a counterclockwise position because when the sh shots, I realized somebody was shooting at me, I pulled down on the right shroud lines to dump air so it pushed me away from where I thought the bullets was coming from. And I caused myself to swing and I kept rotating the whole way down. And I'd, I'd see this forest and the fields and buildings, and I just knew I was going to land in that forest, and that's not a nice thing to do. <laughs> you really get hurt. But I floated, I'd say I was within 200 feet of those trees and floated right over this open field. And uh, I saw a, a, a team of horses out in that field, and I'd see them, and then they'd disappear, and I'd come around and see them again. Well, I come down and hit the side of that horse, of a horse. This farmer was out there harrowing the field. He had a horse and an ox and hitched together. I hit the uh, horse right in front of the left rear leg with my right shoulder and side. I bounced off that and hit the ground backwards. My heels hit ground first, then my buttocks, and then I remember my heels going up over, and then I guess knocked myself out. And when I woke up, the uh, farmer was uh, holding my left foot up by waist high, pulling on it. And I think that maybe it cracked or something that uh, woke me up or something. But it's having, and that's really when I realized I'd been unconscious because I looked to the right and my parachute had been taken off me and rolled up. And that takes time. And my harness was taken off me. And he had to roll me over to get that harness off me. And it was with the parachute. And my knees were in great pain because uh, I hit the ground hard on my heels and those legs just don't bend forward like they do back. So uh, eventually the farmer helped me up and helped me walk around a little bit. And, uh, and then I walked around and by that horse and I grabbed hold of the harness and held on to it and was shaking up my legs or knees and and dawned on me, I better find out where I'm at. So I had a little uh, uh, language dictionary. I got out and went to the French section and uh, showed them an American flyer and needed help, something like that. And this farmer took the book out of my hand and went to the German section, found an American flyer and said, for you the war is over. And that's what I named my book, for you der, for you der war, war ist over. <laughs>